Welcome back to the next installment on our Metabolic Health Summit Conference 2022 preview interview. So it's really my honor and my privilege to be part of the Metabolic Health Summit and that I'm going to be doing interviews at the conference in Santa Barbara in May of 2022 um, with the speakers, with some of the guests, with some of the exhibitors, really just trying to get into the science and the practical nature of what the Metabolic Health Summit is all about, improving your metabolic health um, with a big focus on, on neurological function, but ev every aspect of metabolic health. And as part of that, I'm doing some pre-interviews with some of the esteemed speakers. And today we have Susan Messino. Now, Susan is the Vernon D. Rusa Professor of Applied Sciences at Trinity College with a joint appointment in neuroscience and psychology. And she focuses on promoting and restoring brain health. You can find her on Twitter at Messino Susan, M A S I N O S U S A N. And as you're going to hear in this talk, uh, she has some various interests um, dealing with brain health, whether it's nature, um, whether it's basic science, whether it's nutrition. She likes combining all of those things to say, how can we improve neurologic health? and metabolic health in general, how can we use these different aspects and, and what are the underlying mechanisms that may speak to how they can be used together, um, possibly even synergistically. So a really interesting discussion. Um, I hope you enjoy this, uh, this talk with Susan Messino. And of course, I hope you can join us at the Metabolic Health Summit in May of 2022. Uh, you can check them out online, of course, at their website for the Metabolic Health Summit. All right, enjoy this talk. Thank you. Well, Susan, thanks so much for joining me today. Wonderful to be with you, Brett. Yeah, so as, as I mentioned in the intro, you're, you're going to be a speaker at the Metabolic Health Summit in May, and I'm so looking forward to that conference. And your, your talk is going to be Metabolism and Brain Health, Back to the Future. So I'm very excited to hear more about that. But I have to mention, as I was sort of preparing for this and learning about you and reading about your research studies, I was really drawn to... I guess you can say the juxtaposition of two very different fields. So on the one hand, there's a paper, a unifying mechanism of ketogenic diet action, the multiple roles of nicotinamide adenosine nucleotide. Okay, that's pretty specific. Sounds like good basic science, a lot to do with ketogenic diet. Then I kept digging and I found older and eastern white pine trees sequester carbon for many decades and maximize cumulative carbon. And then there's this whole thing about trees and forests and this whole section about measuring adenosine in the cerebral spinal fluid and ketogenic diet. And I'm thinking, how does she connect the dots to these things? Or maybe are they not connected to each other, but somehow connected to you? So I wanted to start just to kind of learn more about you and how, how all these different subjects kind of come together for you. Well, thank, thank you so much for that question, Brett, because I really feel like combining my interests in the environment and brain health is really sort of coming to the fore. And I've always had an interest in evolution and in complex systems. And there are few systems as complex and just, you know, evolutionary marvels as our brains and um, natural forest ecosystems. So forests have been around for a lot longer than our brains. Uh, they actually evolved before dinosaurs. It's pretty amazing. Um, and we've just started learning so much more about all the interconnections, the underground world. The, there's so much we don't know about um, ecology. And I feel like it's very similar in terms of um, our brains. There's so much we don't know. The whole field of metabolism and metabolic therapy has really broken open a lot of kind of multiple benefits that you can get from metabolic health. And I think, you know, at a different level, we're understanding the many benefits and essential nature of keeping a lifeline of functional ecology going. So um, I've always had this dual interest and I brought them together a couple of years ago in a fellowship at Harvard that was a um, fellowship, Charles Bullard Fellowship between Harvard Medical School and Harvard Forest on forests and brain health to try and look at kind of these common mechanisms. Some of these mechanisms might be related to ketogenic diet at all. So that's kind of, I'm trying to bring together kind of what are all the tools in the toolbox for, for brain health and, um, you know, for the best future for all of us. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, 
we've talked a lot of on the podcast and our YouTube channel about the importance of the environment. Um, sort of this push and pull about plant-based versus ruminants is one evil is one better and like trying to cut through the hyperbole to get to the science of it. So we, we focused on that element of, of nature, but what about the science of nature and how that affects our brains? I mean, you know, we, there are stories in New York times that it's important to get outside and be in nature and it can help with depression and it can help with different things. But I guess what I don't have a good handle on is how good is the science to support that connection? Well, there's actually good science to support the connection, but there's not great science yet to support exactly what are the mechanisms. And in a way, that's kind of a parallel to metabolic therapies where we know that there's these kind of pan health benefits, but we don't yet know the mechanisms. And I think what would be really interesting is, are there some similar mechanisms Mobilize, beneficial mechanisms mobilized by something like metabolic therapy and by something like forest bathing or time in nature. And yeah. are, are those benefits, you know, additive? Are they occlusive? Um, you know, what are the tools you can put in, in the toolbox? Because metabolic therapy is not going to perfectly resolve every neurological condition. But if we can talk about what are all the tools we can put together, I think it's a really exciting time for, you know, ultimately these sort of back to the future kind of therapies to kind of help, you know, where medicine has not been able to find the answers yet. Yeah, that's a great point. And, and like you said, the, the connection between nature and mental health, it, it, there's a strong connection there. And I'll, I mean, Certainly from a personal standpoint, I know nothing helps my mood better than getting outside, getting among the trees, going mountain biking, getting away into nature. Um, so interesting to, to think that the, some connections, the mechanisms could be similar to ketogenic diets or it could be additives or not even just ketogenic diets. I mean, you say, you say metabolic therapy. So what do you mean when you say metabolic therapy? Well, by metabolic therapy, I mean being very strategic about a metabolic approach to health. And that could be a low carb diet. It could be a low glycemic index diet. It could be a ketogenic diet. It could be kind of a more whole food based diet. It could be something that adds exogenous ketones. And we, just among those options, which are pretty well known among the people that are in this field, we don't know, even know the different mechanisms that are mobilized by those those range of therapies, mm -hmm. you know, they're not well known. And I think uh, there's also, um, you know, we need to think about the time factor of changes, mechanistic changes. There may be some things that change very rapidly, and there may be some changes that evolve over time. And I, um, you know, neurological conditions take a while to develop. And so we have to think about, you know, how therapies can also take a little bit longer maybe to peel back that pathology that's developed. Yeah. And, and I love the title of your talk, Back to the Future, and, and how you alluded to maybe addressing these conditions or these issues in ways that modern medicine hasn't been able to, because modern medicine seems so focused on the next drug, the next big blockbuster pharmaceutical. And maybe we're barking up the wrong tree to put a pun in there, a very bad pun in there. But uh, <laughs> um, so, yeah. So is, is that what you mean by back to the future, like getting away from that, the next big shiny drug and getting back to things we could have done a hundred years ago or we did do a hundred years ago, basically? Well, I think it's sort of a, I kind of have a double meaning to that. So in a way, you know, there's many advantages to modern medicine, but we shouldn't forget about these common sense things that can kind of help, you know, or maybe all we need. So we need to not forget about those tools in the toolbox. Um, and these are kind of common sense, you know, what might be called like grandmother advice. But if you look at some of the, you know, um, historically way back in history, of course, um, indigenous cultures, um, thought of nature as sacred spaces and use them for rituals and traditions and healing um, and, you know, purposefully kept these sacred groves. Um, if you look at just, um, you know, in the U.S. in the 1800s, there was John Muir and Thoreau and um, Frederick Law Olmsted, who's celebrating his 200th 
uh, birthday in 2022. And he was extremely thoughtful about how he brought green space and parks um, into cities for their healing properties. And at a time when most uh, health concerns in urban areas was about sanitation and dirty water and you know plague type of stuff, he was really interested in green space as a place where you could have clean air, where you could have that beauty, where the environment could engage and also relax your mind. And he was very aware of these benefits and he was very purposeful about um, making sure that nothing was out of place so that your mind could relax. So he brought native plants to the parks um, plants, trees that you would find on a nearby mountainside. So everything could kind of connect you. Even in the urban area, you could have that connection to the wider um, landscape. And um, was also very aware of the social benefits of these public nature areas where people of all walks of life would intermingle and it would be a real democratic, you know, social space. So just all of the values that he really thoughtfully um, brought into his work we're now realizing are really critical things that we need in our communities for our community health and for our individual health. Uh, just a tiny irony about Frederick Law Olmsted is he worked so hard on the projects he was working on. Um, and he was so busy working on Central Park in New York City, which of course is just the crown jewel of uh, New York City, um, that he had to be sent on a mental health vacation in Europe so to recover his own mental health from working on a project to help other people's mental health. So <laughs> yeah, ironic, sure. But, you know, really translates to today's day and age. I mean, if he was doing it for for a little slice of sanitation and mental health combined. I mean, it's so easy in today's society to wake up, get in your car, drive to work, be indoors in an office all day, drive home, have dinner, sit on the couch, watch TV, go to bed, rinse and repeat. Like, where's the fresh air? Where's the nature? Where's the relaxation? And this yep. chronic stress driving, maybe increased cortisol, increased adrenaline, uh, inflammation chronically, like that definitely can be an underpinning of a number of chronic diseases. So. Those lessons from 200 years ago certainly uh, apply to today as well, no question. Um, now, but a number of your your papers and your studies deal with uh, adenosine and the yeah. role of adenosine as maybe a unifying mechanism for the impact of ketogenic diets. Can you give us just sort of like a, a brief overview of adenosine and why it's in, potentially important um, in ketogenic diets and brain health? Yeah, so I was uh, actually got into working on ketogenic diet through a basic research hypothesis on adenosine, um, because adenosine has been known for a long time to be very neuroprotective and be anti-seizure, um, anti-pain, um, to promote sleep. So adenosine has a number of beneficial qualities. Um, but there's been no way to use adenosine therapeutically because there are identical adenosine receptors in your heart and it will stop your heart only for a short time, but still that's considered <laughs> an unacceptable side effect in pharmaceutical development. So unless you purposely wanna stop the heart and reset it, it's a no-go. Right. So I was interested in how is adenosine regulated and what is it around for? Um, we're constantly regulating our adenosine levels um, with caffeine, actually. So caffeine mm -hmm. is an adenosine receptor antagonist. And um, I was interested in adenosine as a link between brain energy and brain activity. So adenosine is the essentially the core of adenosine triphosphate, ATP, our energy molecule. Um, I hypothesized that adenosine might be regulated um, by pH way back a long time ago. And I started thinking, what are metabolic conditions where pH is regulated? And I came upon ketone-based metabolism without knowing there was such a thing as a ketogenic diet. So long story short, when I realized there was, and it was anti-seizure, and then I found out it could be neuroprotective and have all these other benefits, that's when I really started working on the adenosine hypothesis. And that hypothesis, we've tested it in vitro, in vivo, in a number of different models and predictions. Um, but I think it has a lot of power on several fronts. 
Adenosine is a very dynamic regulator of neuronal activity and very powerful. So when I talked about short-term mechanisms and long-term mechanisms, adenosine has this real dynamic link between energy and brain activity. But what we've also found out is that adenosine can actually um, affect DNA methylation and have this longer-term epigenetic effect. So if you wanted an ideal therapy, you want something that will actually work in a short amount of time and something that will affect a lasting change that could either prevent or, you know, even cu- or delay the progression or cure disease. And that's why I think adenosine is really, really a very, very powerful molecule. And it's found, you know, throughout evolution, it's very highly evolutionarily conserved and it's just a you know, real cornerstone stone of um, physiology. So um, that's why I think it could be really a unifying mechanism because it's not associated with one specific disease. We're still uncovering what all it might be involved in. Yeah, that's really interesting. So if you think about adenosine, if it could be a key feature um, for improving brain function, improving brain health and neurologic in general, um, and you don't want to give it, as a, as a drug because of the side effects, like you said, you, know, you want to try and increase it naturally. So I guess is, I guess questions, are, is a ketogenic diet an, an effective way to naturally increase it? And what are other ways is being in nature, a, an effective way to naturally increase adenosine, you know, like what, what do you see as the, as the take home lifestyle interventions that you can do to naturally raise adenosine? Actually, mechanical pressure also um, increases adenosine. So you could, um, anything that releases ATP into the extracellular space will also increase adenosine. So you could, um, exercise increases adenosine. Um, Increased temperature can increase adenosine. Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe exercise itself, plus maybe a little bit of increased temperature with, I mean, very small changes can, can increase it. Um, we don't know about nature, and I've um, kind of submitted a preliminary grant to try and get at some of these common mechanisms, which would be really, for me, it would be really exciting to find something, some other non-metabolic approach that's so beneficial for so many reasons. Because like you were saying, we're inside all the time, the, the stress, the lights and everything. I mean, one of the really fundamental problems, um, I think, is we've kind of disconnected ourselves from the land, which is really our long-term lifeline. And if we don't establish a more kind of fundamental understanding that nature is really our lifeline, not about, you know, we need to have some areas for resources, of course, and we need research, but we need some areas that are just natural areas that are keeping the planet going. And, um, you know, I know there's a lot of discussion about carbon and greenhouse gas emissions, and that's certainly a problem, but no matter what we do with the carbon, if we wreck our lifeline of nature, that's it. So that's really a primary, primary value. Yeah, so well said, and, and so important that that connection between nature and health, um, and of course we talk a lot about diet, but it goes so much beyond diet into just how we live our lives and how we get outside. Well, let me be the first to to volunteer for one of your studies. If if your study requires being in nature and being among trees more, I want to volunteer first and foremost to be a, a participant. I would love to do that. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> Yeah, well, thank you so much for taking the time to to be with us here today. And as a sort of a preview for your Metabolic Health Summit um, talk coming up in May in Santa Barbara. And I'm so excited for that talk. And hopefully we'll have the opportunity to sit down and and do an interview afterwards, too, where we can get into maybe some more of the details about your talk about metabolism and brain health back to the future. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Brett. Look forward to meeting you soon.